Great, and thank you very much. And, and I hope you can uh, both hear me and see me. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction and also uh, the opportunity to participate in, uh, in today. Um, as I get underway, I just wanted to make a couple of important um, observations. Uh, first of all, I'm very much speaking in a personal capacity today, rather than on behalf of any of the organizations that I, uh, I serve. And the second thing is I want to declare up front, state at the outset, that I actually believe capitalism is a good thing and it has served society well over the last 400 years and at its heart is the collectivization of savings that's turned into investment and created growth, wealth uh, and uh, prosperity. Uh, so it has, I believe, um, promoted over very long periods uh, the, uh, the common good. Of course, the problem is progress has often been erratic uh, as we're experiencing at, uh, at the moment. And for very long periods of time, we get uh, stuck in a particular paradigm and a particular way of doing things. And, and one of the things I think the original Scottish Enlightenment did was change that uh, perception. Now, one of the things that, you know, talking to, to Jeffy, uh, I think that sparked this initial conversation is something on ESG has clicked over the course of the last uh, 18 months. Uh, and suddenly it's become part of the social, uh, the social consciousness. Um, I've struggled as somebody who's been banging on about this for 20 or 30 years to explain why. And explaining why I think is less important than making sure we take advantage of the opportunity uh, that's ahead. And I think one of the things I want to do in the next 10 minutes or so is show that that opportunity is actually very, very significant and potentially, I believe, almost as significant as uh, the, uh, the impact that the in original enlightenment, enlightenment had in society. So whilst capitalism is a system that's promoted the common good, the way in which it's done uh, so through time has, has, has changed, as have the answers to a fundamental question that was posed by Keynes. How do you find a social system which is efficient both economically and morally. And of course, when we first started to answer that question, if I could have my second slide up, uh, that actually began in Edinburgh with Adam Smith and the publication of, uh, of The Wealth of Nations and the creation of um, what became known as uh, the uh, School of uh, Economic Thought on, on, on natural, uh, natural Liberty. I think one of the surprising things from this slide is that whilst we have, have, have seen, you know, uh, capitalism ruling the roost and that the uh, rules and, 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 and thoughts behind the paradigm uh, changed through time effectively um, in the deep background there have only really been three schools of, of, of economic uh, of economic thought at the micro uh, micro level uh, interesting enough and a point I'll come back to the publication of the wealth of nations in 1776 was almost 100 years after uh, the first corporate governance conversation uh, about the Dutch East India's uh, company but of course in the modern world, we've got less used to talking about the microeconomic schools of thoughts. And if we can move to the next slide, and our world has tended to be dominated by what we call macroeconomics, which of course was created by John Maynard Keynes back in um, 19, uh, 1936 as a reaction to uh, the, uh, the, Great, uh, the Great Depression. That's morphed over time until we've had it's, uh, it's the, the, the latest part of macro theory, uh, something that is rather attractively called 
dynamic stochastic general equilibrium uh, theory, which is something which dominates the way in which the Fed kind of thinks about uh, the world. But again, relatively few um, schools of, uh, of economic thought. What these paradigms have done, though, is you know, constrain and, uh, uh, the way in which we think about things and more importantly, create a particular policy paradigm for the way in which we address economic and, uh, and social, uh, social issues. We move to the next slide. One of the interesting things for, uh, for, the, economy, for the economists amongst you is that whilst uh, prosperity and living standards have improved immeasurably over, uh, over the, the course of the last couple of hundred of years. Actually, average growth rates uh, haven't changed a great deal. So, so, so one of the things that these schools of economic thought have an impact on is the way in which wealth is distributed around uh, society. And of course, that is something that, 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 that finance kind of lies at, uh, at the heart of. If we look at uh, a similar set of uh, data and move to the next slide and, 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 and think about uh, uh, macroeconomics and think about the output gap, so the way in which uh, economies have, have diverted uh, from, uh, from, from, from full employment, uh, and full utilization of uh, resources, you can see that's a much more volatile uh, uh, in, in environment and has led to change. These macroeconomic paradigms, though, are not just a product of economic, uh, of economic theory. Um, they're very much defined by the problems of the day, whether it's addressing slavery or, uh, or the corn laws, dealing with the Great Depression, dealing with the rampant inflation of and, and, and rising unemployment in, uh, in the 1970s. So very difficult to step away uh, and get public policy to step away from the problems of the, of, of the day. What I think is really important today is that I think we stand on the cusp of a, another paradigm change. You move to the next slide, uh, please. And we shouldn't just be thinking about the next five or 10 years, but actually I think there is a real chance to make a difference and generate a, a, a very different policy uh, paradigm and finance has to play its role. Um, one of the signals for that is that when you shift between policy paradigms in this stylized diagrams and you get in between the two, uh, the two tails of the distribution, that's when you see maximum volatility, typically in economic activity and in, uh, in financial markets. So it's perhaps no surprise um, to those of you that are involved in financial markets that 2000 and 18 was one of the worst years on record for financial returns since 1909. 2019 was one of the best and 2020 was I think probably one of uh, the strangest. So I think the signals that we're getting from that kind of volatility says, you know, time is ripe for this fundamental paradigm change. So if we can change, if we can um, uh, move to the next slide, um, I think the real question uh, for, uh, for those of us that are involved and would like to see uh, some form of paradigm change and policy enlightenment is what should be the future of that new policy paradigm? And I, I've, I've basically listed five here, which we can, we can tackle in discussions. One is um, the economists really need a set of economic models that, 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 that um, inform policy, which fully integrate the real and financial sectors of, uh, of, of the economy. I haven't seen anything yet. I think we're a long way away from that. Something I think that is incredibly important, and I think we still have to make progress on, is that a responsible and sustainable corporate sector has to be right at the heart of creating uh, 
uh, prosperity. I have a slight concern at the moment that actually the corporate sector gets a bad press. That's a worry when you think about most modern capitalist economies, over 70% of, 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 of people are employed in the private sector. In the UK, uh, it's over 75, uh, 75%. So their future and how they view the world is generated by uh, their experience. And somehow we have to put the private corporate sector back at the heart of responsible and sustainable wealth uh, creation. I think the other thing where we need to move on as part of this policy paradigm is accept that um, regulation, rather than something difficult and horrible, is actually a public good. It helps markets work in the public interest and only when it works well can they promote uh, the common good couple of uh, pointers towards that. What we call macro prudential policy, so the regulation that governs the behavior of insurance companies, banks, and um, uh, pension funds, actually that really does drive the deep incentives uh, in the financial system. So, so actually, if we really do want uh, a set of uh, a set of behaviors that are promoting decarbonization, promoting sustainability, uh, diversity and uh, inclusion, then actually that detailed regulatory policy needs to point in, 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 in that direction. Um, it's also the case, I think, that transparency and reporting really does influence behaviors. Um, there was a famous remark from a Nobel economist called George Stigler, Stigler who said um, rather controversially that um, economists needed arithmetic, not ethics, to correct social mistakes. Um, at a very high level, that's something I fundamentally disagree with. But I do think what gets measured gets done, and he has a point. So transparency and reporting and the need to report becomes an incredibly important influence on behaviors, including those in uh, the corporate sector. So full adoption of, 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 of TCFD, uh, full adoption of, of metrics like, uh, like SASB, and full reporting, uh, I think, will uh, actually be very, very important so that we understand the risks that are being taken on board. I think the other important point I, I, I would make is that people and policymakers determine social license, uh, not, uh, not markets. In prepping for this, I, I reread some Adam Smith, and there's a very good biography of Adam Smith by Jesse Norman. And he points out in the whole, the whole of, of Adam Smith's works, he only mentions the invisible hand three times. It's only measure, it's only mentioned once in the wealth of uh, in the wealth of nations and it isn't about unfettered markets so actually um, we need to determine what it is that we're about the final thing is for those people that really uh, do i think argue uh, quite strongly about uh, regulation uh, just being a burden and a cost actually it's if, if you get good behaviors then it's those good behaviors will minimize the cost and burden of, uh, of regulation. Uh, and I think that's where we, everybody needs to take uh, responsibility uh, for the way in which they promote uh, the common good. I think the final part of the, of, 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 of the policy paradigm that, that, that needs to drop away uh, relates to a whole bunch of stuff created by uh, Jensen, Meckling and Jensen in the 1970s about the principal agent problem. It absolutely dominates all of our governance, uh, all of our governance conversations. I actually do believe that good stewardship behaviors, stewardship that's put at the center of policy can mitigate those principal agent problems. And that is the way in which we build trust. That's the way in which we build a responsible and sustainable uh, corporate 
sector. And given that finance is right at the heart of pointing collectivized savings at the financing uh, of, uh, uh, of investment and recovery, we have a huge opportunity as an industry to put substance into building back better. But we'll only do that if we all take uh, personal responsibility for the promotion of uh, the public good. So this is um, everyone's problem, not just the policymakers. If we can do that, then I think we will engender another period of uh, prosperity uh, that promotes health and uh, health and wealth. And if you want a short run example of why regulation is um, a, uh, a good thing and why capitalism, capitalism is a good thing, just think about Boris Johnson's remarks last night. Um, I actually disagree that it was, it was greed. I agree that the capitalist system has promoted, but it was effective regulation that allowed and clear cut regulation that allowed the development innovation of a vaccine and a quick route to market. So, um, you know, we have, I think, a real opportunity, as I say, to put the substance in to build back better. Um, at that point, at those high level points, I'll, I'll, I'll um, hand over uh, to, uh, to Casey.